Hello everyone and welcome to That Christian Nerd YouTube channel. So I consider myself as someone who is decently versed in mental health related stuff. Of course, I'm definitely no expert, but I've taken high school and college classes in this subject and I do my own study into mental health and psychology and things like that because it is one of the things that I am interested in. Uh, with that said, I wanted to respond to a video from a Christian counselor where she claimed that demonic spirits are behind the narcissistic personality type. So what we're going to do, though, is uh, have a section dedicated to learning about and understanding narcissism. Then we're going to uh, give a review of her video using theology and psychology. And then I will give closing remarks and sources that you can go to. I would encourage anyone to check out the sources in the description of this video and as well as check out my link tree there so you can see my other social media accounts and find a way to support me financially if you are so inclined to do so. So with that said, let's talk about what narcissism is. So Psychology Today has an article on narcissism and it talks about it a little bit here and says narcissism does not necessarily represent a surplus of self-esteem or of insecurity. More accurately, it encompasses a hunger for appreciation or admiration, a desire to be the center of attention, and an expectation of special treatment reflecting perceived higher status. Uh, it continues on, narcissism is characterized by a grandiose sense of self-importance, a lack of empathy for others, a need for excessive admiration, and a belief that one is unique and deserving of special treatment. Uh, and we would see someone as narcissist if they exhibit those behaviors or characteristics consistently. It is noted here that a narcissist is someone who has a pathological level of narcissism, says psychotherapist Alina, uh, founder of Coastal Light Counseling and Psychotherapy and author of Swimming with Sharks, Surviving Narcissistic Infected Waters. However, notes Shidiano, narcissism is inherently within all of us and it's inherently healthy. She points to the example of adolescents who need to have a healthy level of narcissism so they can focus on themselves and become their own person and separate from their parents. It's when the characteristics of narcissistic behavior interfere with a person's relationships and daily life that it becomes pathological. So I'm just giving you guys a basic understanding real quick of narcissism so we could get into the video, but I would highly, highly, highly encourage you guys to check out Dr. Romney. She has some amazing videos on this topic and really helped me understand what racism is and what is going on here. But it is important to note that it is a collection of behavioral patterns that are consistent. It is a combination of personality traits put together and demonstrated consistently. And that's why we would say someone is a narcissist. So with that said, let's go ahead and get into the video. Why do narcissists mess with your mind so much? Oh, well, that's actually pretty easy to answer. Uh, we're told, for example, by Dr. Hoffman that their defensiveness and inability to take criticism can quickly turn into gaslighting behavior that leaves you doubting yourself. The article continues on and says that's precisely the goal of a narcissist, to be recognized consistently as superior regardless of their actual achievements or behavior in the relationship, says Dr. Forshee. So the reason why a narcissist would mess with your mind so much and manipulate you, gaslight you, these sorts of things is because of a constant and chronic need for attention and to feel superior to everyone else, regardless of how that affects you. And again, because of their lack of empathy, for the most part, a narcissist is not going to care about how that affects you. But why does she think that narcissists mess with your mind? It's because your mind is Satan's number one target. If he can get in your head, he can affect and infect every other area of your life. And he starts by using the people closest to you. Wow. So, <laughs> um, so of course, I am a Christian, right? So I'm going to say that, you know, Satan does exist. He is active in the world, these sorts of things. But 
and we're going to see this as we get into the video, but there is no evidence for what she just said. And as I just mentioned, there is a perfectly good and valid explanation as to why a narcissist messes with your mind. It has nothing to do with Satan, and it has everything to do with what the narcissist wants. Let's go ahead and continue, however. Narcissism is a deeply infectious personality problem that can affect and infect every area of your life. But did you know that there are actually demonic spirits that are driving that grandiose self-entitled behavior? Uh, that's not true. <laughs> um, let's, let's actually stop here for a moment and talk about this. So what causes narcissism? Well, this research article from 2015, The Origins of Narcissism in Children, says that narcissism was predicted by parental overvaluation, not by lack of parental warmth. Attesting to the specificity of this finding, self-esteem was predicted by parental warmth, not by parental overvaluation. These findings are consistent with the view that children come to see themselves as they believe to be seen by significant others, as if they learn to see themselves through others' eyes. To add to this study, Dr. Romney answers the question of whether or not narcissists are born or made, you know, that nature versus nurture discussion. And here's what she has to say. What causes narcissism? It's, it's, there's actually a lot of pathways to this and the city of Oz that we call narcissism. There's a lot of ways you get there. Um, a lot of people, the big question everyone has is, are you born this way or are you made? Mm -hmm. It's mostly made, but there's a little bit of born. And what's the percentage on that? I, I, you know, I, I, if I were to spitball, I'm going to go with like an 80, 20 or a 90, 10 in terms of made versus born. I mean, the inborn part is that because the fact of the matter is we see people come from invalidating early environments or overindulged or spoiled early environments and they don't turn out narcissistic. So there's got to be something else at play, right? And that's probably where that temperamental piece comes in. Kids who are likely more hypersensitive, hyper-emotional. Um, if you look at Marsha Linehan's work on borderline personality disorder, she actually talks about that mix between the biological vulnerability plus the invalidation of the early environment. There's likely something like that happening in narcissism too, but it's mostly made. So let's let's view it as almost concentric circles. And let's start at the middle circle, okay. which is really what happens in the family when the child is first growing up. Children who are children who don't get consistent emotional mirroring for the, from their parents, that's a setup for becoming a narcissist later on. Because that's how children learn to regulate their emotional worlds. They learn how to self-soothe their emotions. They learn how to take responsibility for their emotions. They learn how to understand their emotions from how they're mirrored by their parents. And if their parents have consistent, appropriate reactions and are available to them, that's how the child learns that. So if a child, for any number of reasons, doesn't have that kind of consistent feedback from their parents, the parents are distracted, the parents are absent, the parents don't care, the parents are addicted to drugs and are not available in that way. All of those could be contributors to that. Parents just are abusive in some way. Obviously, that can be a contributor too to inconsistent kinds of mirroring. And then the child doesn't learn, like I said, to sort of regulate their own emotion. They keep looking to the environment for validation because frankly, they're confused. We also think about narcissism in the early environment as a function of attachment. Children who have secure, healthy attachments tend to go on to adulthood and make more secure, healthy attachments. But kids who have more anxious or avoidant attachments, that can set the tone for attachment issues in adulthood. And they're not able to make those kinds of successful attachments in, in adulthood. So their relationships are really fraught with lots of in and out, back and forth, rather than the consistency you'd see from a secure attachment with a parent. Um, the other thing I often say is that Parents who are narcissistic, parents who create narcissistic kids who go on to become narcissistic adults, we see a pattern of simultaneous overindulgence and underindulgence. And what I mean by that is these are the kids where if they do the sport their parent wants or get the straight A's or the prima ballerina dancer or whatever it is they do, the best violin player, whatever, or they want to take over dad's business, whatever the thing they say they want to do, if the parents can get a good public 
face from it, they were overindulged the kid in that way. They'll drive them to every practice. They'll go out of their way. But when that child has an emotional need that needs to be met, the parents are nowhere to be found. Like they're interested when their kid's on stage. They're interested when their kid's on the field. They're interested when the child's getting an honor or doing what they want them to do. But when that kid really needs their emotional needs to be met, it's it's completely an impoverished environment. That's what I mean by being over mm -hmm. and underindulged. Um, it's also what we call modeling. It's what they see in their environment. If they watch a parent constantly be entitled, they're going to learn to be entitled. Mm -hmm. If they watch a parent who has no empathy, they're not going to learn empathy. Empathy is learned in childhood. You cannot teach a 30-year-old how to be empathic. That's an early game. So the reality of the situation is that we do have evidence and an a understanding of what causes narcissism. It's not perfect from what I could tell, but Dr. Romney and others have given a pretty good case that it starts in childhood and it has to do with environment. But let's continue and see what she has to say. You see, a narcissist is someone who has yielded to the demonic spirits that are driving their destructive behavior. And these spirits tempt the narcissist with a false sense of hope, strength, and control. You see, and this is going to become clear as we get into this, but she has this really weird and I would say hyper charismatic view that there are these spiritual beings that cause like fear and a bunch of other things, pride and so on, and that these are infecting the person to become narcissistic. And because the narcissist has such a deep sense of shame that they desperately try to avoid and cover up, they actually become easy targets for wicked spirits to have their way. The demonic goal is to not only destroy the life of those that they infect, but also the lives of those that are connected to the narcissist. And people they couldn't otherwise get to are now easy prey for these demons as the narcissist now becomes their Trojan horse. Their goal? To make you feel like you're going crazy and to get you consumed in the narcissistic behavior so that you have no time or energy to focus on God and his purpose for your life. Demons will use narcissists, number one, to jam up your receiving signal from God. Number two, what does that mean? <laughs> what? What do you mean by that? I, okay, I'll just breeze over that. To keep you on an exhausting emotional roller coaster, number three, trap you in a toxic mental spiral, number four, deceive you into believing that as a Christian, you're somehow responsible for improving this person's behavior in the relationship. So, so uh, that is something important. Let let's just take that out of this like weird spiritual hypercharismatic context that she's saying all of this in. It is really important. And Dr. Romney, the person I showed earlier in this video, has made note of this several times in her videos. But what will happen is that a, a narcissist will a narcissist will be in a relationship with someone who wants to help them, right? And wants to be there for him. And he might even feel bad about their childhood or something like that. And narcissists will use that to manipulate them and things of that nature. But a person will stay in the relationship because they think, oh, well, if I, you know, maybe in a Christian context, they say, well, if I just gave them the gospel, you know, if I just be like Christ to them in outside of a Christian context, they'll say, well, maybe if I just love them enough, maybe if they just got that job and all these sorts of things, then they'll treat me better and then they'll love me or something like that. And that's very sad, but that is the position that a lot of people find themselves in. And it's really important to note that he, as Dr. Romney, like I said, has noted in her videos, you're not that magic person. You are not the magic spell that is going to change the beast, so to speak. This is not a Beauty and the Beast situation. This is not like a Damon and Elena situation from Vampire Diaries, if you catch that reference. Uh, he's He or she is not going to change. Not without really, really, really intense therapy from a good therapist and psychologist. 
So she is right there. It's not your responsibility to change their behavior and you will spend years of your life attempting to do so only to fail constantly. But everything else surrounding this, what she's saying here is, is unbiblical and also very unscientific. So to better arm you, let's talk about eight of the common demonic spirits that operate behind narcissists. So we're not going to talk about every single one of these. Uh, we're just going to go through a couple of points in her video. And how you can overcome. Number one is the spirit of witchcraft. You think witchcraft is limited to voodoo and black magic? You may want to think again. Behind witchcraft is rebellion and manipulation. And narcissists are master manipulators. And remember, the words of 1 Samuel 15, 23, for rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Okay, so let's talk about this. This is something I've noticed in hypercharismatic circles where they will uh, say that something is witchcraft if there is a element of control and manipulation. The problem with this is that, I mean, there are multiple problems with this, but the problem with this right off the bat is that this is too vague because every time I type and do something on the computer, I'm manipulating and controlling something. When I'm playing video games, I'm manipulating and controlling. Every time I draw, I'm manipulating and controlling. So unless you're going to say all of those things are witchcraft, which is just going to make you sound like a cult at that point, um, we need a different definition. Another problem arises, and I've pointed this out in a different video, uh, this video in particular, witchcraft is an extremely difficult thing to define. And the biblical authors do not define witchcraft in the way that this creator is doing. So her definition of witchcraft is not the understanding that John the Revelator, that the writers of the Old Testament texts were working with when they were condemning this. But what about the passage that she referenced? Well, let's talk about that as well. Well, this site has some very interesting thoughts on this passage. So it says, we need to clarify the Hebrew text. What the King James Version translates as stubbornness is actually presumption. What the King James translates as witchcraft is actually divination. While divination is in the realm of sorcery, the text specifies divination. So the correct translation is rebellion is like the sin of divination and presumption is as idolatry and iniquity. Starting from that very point, we now go into the answer to the question, and we need to look at the context. So in verse 12, we are told, So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself, and he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gigal. This verse makes it clear that Saul erected a monument to himself, breaking the commandment of Exodus 20. Thou shalt not build unto the any graven images. So the expression and presumption is as idolatry and iniquity is a reminder comparison of those two sins committed by Saul because in the same context we see Saul had the presumption to forgive Agag and the cattle because this was not the command given by God. Saul argued in verse 20 that he had obeyed God but God reminded reminds him that the presumption he had at that time is equal to the idolatry and iniquity of having erected a monument to himself. Uh, I'll quote the last little bit here. Uh, now, the first part, the rebellion is like the sin of divination. God uses it to remind Saul when he sinned by offering sacrifice instead of waiting for Samuel to do it, as we see in 1 Samuel 13, 12. In this way, Saul thought and presumed or guessed that the Philistines would come against him, forgetting what God had said through Samuel in 1 Samuel 12, 14. So in conclusion, the whole sentence for rebellion is like the sin of divination and presumption is as idolatry and iniquity. It is simply God reminding Saul through Samuel of the sins which he had committed. 
someone in this uh, forum here actually makes another important point where it says divination is not inherently evil. The reference to casting lots is common in scriptures and has the connotation of fearing God and quotes several passages for that, as we can see here. And it continues, likewise, the high priest used Urum and Thurmum and divined all the time. Any time the Old Testament speaks of inquire of the Lord, it is the Urum and Thurmum. So the issue is not trying to divine God's will. The question is, who do you turn to when determining God's will? Do you ask the high priest or prophet of God like Samuel, or do you ask a witch or pagan, pagan like Balaam? I will not be able to show it on the screen, but the New International Commentary of the Old and New Testament comments on this passage and says, Here, a constructive chain, the sin of divination, A of B, is in parallel with a riotous wickedness and idolatry, A plus B, with the elements A and B corresponding to A and B, respectively. Thus, the parallelism conveys one thought through two lines. Rebellion and presumption is the wicked sin which directly opposes the sovereignty of the Lord. In other words, Saul's disobedience to the word of the Lord is as wicked as idolatry or divination which seeks the will of no God. So there is poetry, parallelism, and comparison that is happening here, which is why a lot of translations will say that it is like the sin of because there is poetry going on in this passage, as the commentary points out. And furthermore, this does not encompass like all witchcraft or all forms of manipulation. It encompasses a specific thing, which is Saul's specific sins. So I do not think this passage helps to support her point. Many will even refer to this spirit as the Jezebel spirit. So here we get the notion that the spirit of Jezebel is a actual thing. And what I want to do for this, because even though I'm not a hyper charismatic, I am a charismatic, but I want to give you some charismatic sources that talk about this notion. So Dr. Sam Storms has an article called What is the Jezebel Spirit? Even though he does use the term in this article, he does say a brief word is in order about my use of the phrase spirit of Jezebel or Jezebel spirit, language that, although not strictly biblical, has been banded about in charismatic circles for generations, but perhaps is not as familiar to those in mainstream evangelicalism. I've read numerous articles, books, and listened to an equal number of sermons on the so-called Jezebel spirit. To be honest, I haven't found them very helpful. In most cases, they are speculative meanderings that show little concern for the biblical text. I also would like to give you guys another charismatic source that has analyzed and talks about this specific concept. So this is a group of charismatics who run the radio show and YouTube channel Remnant Radio. I would really encourage you guys to check them out. They have a wide array of topics that they have discussed and people that they've brought on, both people you would really disagree with and maybe even consider heretics, but they want to explore that theology and be open to some of those things and things, people that you would definitely agree with. People range anywhere from what you might consider to be hyper charismatics to people like Dr. Carmen Imes, Dr. Michael Brown, Dr. Michael Heiser, and others. Here is their thoughts as charismatics on the Jezebel spirit. Uh, where we all stand on the Jezebel B spirit, maybe there's such a thing as a Jezebel B spirit. The Bible does def or definitely does not teach it. And as a broad principle, let's stay away from teachings of speculation. Let's stay 100%. away from teachings that are trying to explore this in the angelic realm and this in the demonic realm and this is that demon's name and, and so on. Um, might a demon tell us its name? Yes. And might we cast the demon out by addressing it by the name that it tells us? Yes, that can happen. But we don't need to be going around just being like, oh, she has a little too much eyeshadow on. It's because she's a Jezzy B. Like, this is, this is not good. I think we're all on the same page. All right, we're going to do a little bit more in the video. I'm not going to go through all of the eight spirits that she claims are behind narcissism, but there's just a little bit more that I want to talk about. All right, let's talk about this. It's a spirit of fear. The spirit of fear weighs heavy on a narcissist. 
Behind their false bravado is a scared, immature little child who can't function well in life. And although they come across as fearless, it's actually just a facade that they erect to get others to think that they have confidence where there is none. They carry intense shame that they cover up and they look for targets who are insecure and easy to manipulate to give the appearance of courage. But the truth is they are riddled with fear. And that's why they try so hard to control and manipulate you. So let's talk about this for a minute. So as Dr. Romney has noted and as others have noted, it, it does seem to be true that narcissists are deeply insecure. The New York publication has an article that says narcissism is driven by insecurity and not a inflated sense of self finds a new study which offers a more detailed understanding of this long examined phenomena and may explain what motivates the self-focused nature of social media activity. So that definitely is the case. However, the notion that there is a spirit of fear is unbiblical. And I've already addressed that in one of my videos. So I'm going to play that little clip from that video. Now you might say, well, this concept is actually taught to us in the Bible. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, that God has not given us a spirit of fear. That means that there is a spirit of fear that exists in the world and we need to be delivered from it. But using this as a test example, I want to read to you guidelines from 2 Timothy for counseling people with fears by John F. Butler from the Westminster Theological Journal. Please go read the article as it's another one that deals with the scriptures and psychology. But in it, it says Paul's illustration also presses home another point. Timothy must not expect his fears to be conquered instantly. He will not pray and find them miraculously gone. The soldier, athlete and farmer work and train long hours for weeks and months before they experience the results of their efforts. Timothy must expect a struggle with his fears before he overcomes them. I could not find a single commentary that thinks that this is a actual spiritual being that causes fear. And this makes sense given the context we see in verse four that Timothy seemed to have gotten really emotional. And then verses five through seven is Paul trying to encourage Timothy. The Pillar New Testament commentary also argues that in the Greek, we can translate this as the spirit God gave. So the verse would say, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid. With this translation in mind, there are certain things that the Holy Spirit does not give Timothy and certain things that the Holy Spirit does give Timothy. But the timidness or the fear or however you want to translate that Greek term there is Timothy's. It's not a spirit's. You are actively hurting the body of Christ when you say things like you did and you and other Christians need to stop. I would encourage you guys to check out that whole video for context. But this notion is unbiblical and it does hurt the body of Christ. So her original video will be down in the description. I'm not going to go through her entire video. As I mentioned, like all of the different spirits or the ending of her video. But do not go to her for counseling. If these are the kinds of things she's going to believe about narcissism and mental health, I can't imagine how much damage she's actually done by engaging in this kind of theology. I know people who have had their mental health severely damaged by hypercharismatic beliefs like this. And it is extremely problematic and extremely dangerous. She does attempt to give a biblical tip for avoiding narcissists, which, and she quotes a passage and basically just encourages people to avoid them. Uh, but the issue is that narcissists are your family members. They're your friends. They're your loved ones, these sorts of things. So it can be very difficult. Your, you know, your coworkers, boss, and so on. It can be very difficult then to avoid them. And so I am going to link in the description of a video to some resources that you guys can access that would be much better uh, than her counseling and a link to an article for some tips as to how you can deal practically with a narcissist in your life. And so I do hope that helps. Again, I am not a medical 
again, I am not a psychologist or anything like that. That's why I'm quoting all of these different sources and trying to bring them all together to help me analyze this video and to help me and you understand what the truth about narcissism actually is, how she's not demonstrating that despite being a Christian counselor. And I just thought it would be important to make sure that there were some resources just in case you needed help in this area. There is definitely a lot that could be said. There is a conversation that needs to be had between different Christians about mental health because a lot of Christians just do not understand mental health. And it is very sad and very unfortunate. And particularly in the case of this Christian counselor, it's really sad because again, she's claiming to be a counselor. In other videos, she has claimed to have dealt with people who are narcissistic. So it's extremely ridiculous on her part, especially she of all people, a counselor who deals with narcissism should know better than to ascribe demonic activity to something that for which we have evidence of that it's not demonic at all. I mean, I really don't know what to call this other than like ridiculous weird. Again, I want to be respectful to her, but I truly, after watching her video in multiple times to do this analysis and review, I do not understand how she's a counselor. So please guys, make sure you go to the medical and mental health experts for things. We can trust the psychological literature and we can trust the science. What's really important to note is that God made science and God made our bodies and brains. So it's a perfectly valid thing to do to give a analysis as to how those things, our bodies and brains affect us. And psychology and other fields have done a good job of that. So please go into those fields and get educated, especially on mental health, so that you don't make mistakes like this creator did. With all that said, I hope you enjoy the video. Please grab all the links in the description. Go check them out. I will provide the resources I use as well as resources that could maybe be beneficial to you. And check out my link tree so you can find me on my other socials and give financially if you so desire. There will also be a link to my online store where you can buy beauty and skincare products. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.